Some of London's newest landmarks are skyscrapers, and there are going to be more of them. Just look at all those cranes. More and more office buildings reaching up into the sky. It must have been very different 100 years ago. Then the city was dominated by buildings of state and churches. It was a city of spires. Six hundred years ago, London was dominated by the magnificent old St Paul's Cathedral. Its 425-foot spire was the tallest ever built. But disaster struck with the Great Fire of 1666. The blaze raged for four days and nights and destroyed old St Paul's. And what arose from the ashes was this the wonderful new St Paul's, an iconic building known all over the world. And at 365 feet high, it was until the 1950s the tallest building in London. It's 510 feet long, 280 feet wide, and the architect was Sir Christopher Wren. London has often been described as Wren's city, and a total of 51 churches were built by him, but his greatest feat is St Paul's. What must it have been like as a building site? A massive activity, because they were knocking down the old building while they were building the new one. In fact, it took 20 years to demolish old St Paul's. The stone they, they got from that building, they used for the construction. So you mean there were chaps with pickaxes there, yes putting the stone in barrows, rushing it up, and masons there. That's right, um, <laughs> using it for the basic wall structure of the crypt. So an army of people, an absolute anthill. Yes. Who, who actually oversaw it, you know, ran it on site? Over all these people, Wren himself, who right. came to the site every Saturday and was said to have been carried up in a basket to look at the work as it was going on. Oh, now, all of this end is nice and sort of bright and clean the stone, but all of that end is black dark. Why is that? Well, it looks dark from here. Um, it's mosaic work put in in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Victorians were very unhappy about the internal decoration of St Paul's. They right. felt the building had never been properly finished. Wren had wanted it white. In fact, all these walls were originally painted white. Right. Um, but the Victorians felt that the choir in particular should be more colorful. The inside of St Paul's is truly spectacular but it's what lies behind the scenes that's even more impressive. Now, Gordon, I don't understand where we are. We've come up hundreds of steps, spiral staircases. Out there is obviously a dome. Yes. But in here, there's a great lot of brickwork. And not only is it brick, which we don't see from inside, but it goes straight up. It's not curved. Yes, well, this is the brick cone that supports the stone lantern right at the top of the dome. Right. When you look at the dome of St Paul's from a distance, it looks as if the lantern is resting on the dome, the outer dome. So why can't it rest on that outer dome? Well, this outer dome is just a, a cladding of lead on wood. You mean this isn't strong enough to hold the lantern up? No, it's not doing any supporting work at all. I'm now right at the top of St Paul's, and I don't believe that in this program there'll be a grander building than this. I'm standing exactly on that brick cone. This is called the Golden Gallery, and there is the great heavy stone lantern. And a rather curious feature of the lantern is that in one of Wren's early designs, it looked very much like the gherkin there. He was 300 years ahead of his time. It took 36 years to complete this building, and it was the first English cathedral that was completed within the life of the architect. And when he finally died, they put an inscription in the crypt that says, Si monumentum requiris circumspici. If you're looking for my memorial, look around you. Wren's classical masterpiece dominates the city. But journey further west up the Thames and you'll see an example of classical architecture made modern. Even from a distance, Battersea Power Station looks big, but from here it's absolutely enormous, a temple of power. 
It was originally planned in the 1920s to help cope with London's rapidly rising demand for electricity. And when the first station, there are actually two back to back, when Battersea A opened in 1933, there were wonderful comments in the press. Somebody even wrote, it bids fair to make St Paul's Cathedral share her proud place as London's architectural landmark. They used to bring the coal in by river, and the coal was hauled out by cranes. There are two of them still there, amazingly. Just imagine the scene, the barges jostling for position, the cranes heaving the coal onto the side, the enormous noise. It must have been quite a sight for sore eyes. This is Turbine Hall A, the original one built about 1930, and it's absolutely massive. What's more, it's beautiful. Just look up there, you see these columns, fluted columns going all the way up, and yet a huge great industrial crane across the top. It's halfway between sort of Art Deco Museum and industrial building site. And the size, the size is truly extraordinary. If you take the whole building, the footprint is the same size as Trafalgar Square. And they tell me you could fit St Paul's Cathedral inside without touching the walls. Now, I reckon that Ealing Feeder 3 needs a bit more power, so we'll just turn it up a bit here. And just look at this control panel. Hundreds and hundreds of dials and levers and switches and knobs. And such a grand room, the control room. There was a beautiful parquet floor underneath this hardboard. The control desks all covered in walnut veneer. And the ceiling, amazing Art Deco ceiling. Now, I reckon that's quite enough of that. Whoops. The chimneys here are 337 feet high, and when Station A was opened, they were the highest chimneys in London. The architect desperately wanted to make them square because he thought it would be more in keeping with the, the size and grandeur of the building. But unfortunately, he was overruled, and so they're round. Well, wish me luck. Um, how often do these things fall down? Just once. Just once? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Oh, I have to say, I hate heights, and I'm very glad that we're only 250 feet up and not, not, not right at the top of those chimneys. It's now being regenerated as a commercial and leisure complex, and they're going to revive another thing that used to happen way back then. They used to take water from the river, warm it up, and then pump the warm water to that huge biscuit-coloured complex of flats over there. That's Churchill Gardens, which was part of a massive post-war rebuilding programme that went on all over London. German bombing in World War II had destroyed almost half a million homes, so rebuilding was an absolute necessity. But it was also an opportunity to move families out of slums and into new, modern housing. Jerry, you know all about this sort of thing. I guess the houses they built after the war were a huge improvement for working class people. Yes, it's, it's difficult to exaggerate the scale of the housing problem in London of the 1940s. Something like 60% of all Londoners lacked access to a bath, even a shared one. Many working class families lacked hot water. Now this had to be dealt with immediately after the war had finished. Uh, but London couldn't expand outwards because it was locked into the green belt and kept in place by planning policies. Central land values, central London land values were very high, and so the only solution was to build upwards. So what sort of buildings did they build? They built towers and government was encouraging local authorities to build thousands of houses per year. And so they gave extra subsidy for each dwelling which was built above a certain height. Oh, really? Like this. More money for the top ones? More money for the high ones. This is one of the most famous tower blocks in London. It's Trellick Tower by Erno Goldfinger. Ian Fleming famously pinched his name. Oh, really? For James Bond novel. <laughs> it took six years to build and was opened in 1974. It's uh, 31 storeys high, uh, 328 feet, I think. Right. So what's the separate bit up the side? Is that the lift shaft? It is a lift shaft with walkways onto the main block. 
At the very top is a fantastic viewing tower for the residents who look all over West London. They must be able to see for miles. Right across London itself and yeah. out to the other side. Terrific. In its early years, it worked very well. It was very popular among its tenants. When people objected about tower blocks to the newspapers, people from Trellick Tower wrote and said, come and see us, we're right. very happy. But it went down as so many of these things did in the 1980s. But in the 90s, it's really picked up. I understand that you know, a few of the flats have been sold off, uh, but people are proud and happy to live here. It's got a uh, protected entrance with a concierge. It works well as housing now. Now, I gather it's a listed building, is that right? That's right, it was recently listed as, as one of the key examples of what's called brutalism in modern <laughs> architecture. As a building form, it's a magnificent statement, I think, even if you, know, you find it hard to, to feel that it's lovely, but yeah. it is a magnificent building. Be honest, do you like it? No. <laughs> I don't think I do either. But it wasn't just for housing that they started building tower blocks. Once they started doing it for offices, the London skyline was changed forever. Just after the Second World War, there was a limit to how high anyone could build in central London. It seems amazing now, but no one was allowed to go above 100 feet. This, of course, was very unpopular with the young, enthusiastic architects who'd seen the skyline in New York. So when they relaxed the restriction in 1954, there was an absolute explosion of tall buildings, mostly office blocks. Within 15 years, there were 100 buildings more than 100 feet high and 16 more than 300 feet, including this one, Centre Point. When it was finished, Centre Point was the highest building in London, 384 feet, 36 storeys. It's a very ingenious building because it's built out of pre-cast concrete slabs that are H-shaped and if you look at the windows you'll see that up the middle the, the vertical bits are the cross pieces of the H's and all the H's are stacked on top of one another it's very high it absolutely dominates the streets around here and it makes it very windy down at ground level and for those reasons some people absolutely hated it but it's now grade 2 listed I have to say I still don't like it very much However, the problem with building big in London, oddly enough, is the ground itself. Unlike the rock of New York, London is actually floating on a bed of soft clay. So engineers had to come up with ingenious ways to stop tall buildings literally sinking into the ground. And here I am in the basement of the BT Tower. Now, 174 feet down below ground level is hard chalk. And in principle, for the foundations, they could have sunk piles all the way down into the chalk, but it's a very long way. It would have cost an awful lot of money. So what were they going to do? Well, an Italian firm came to the rescue, and they made a raft. And the raft is down there. If you look, that black bit down there is actually the top surface of the raft. The raft is 90 feet square and three feet thick and reinforced with six layers of steel cables. Sitting on top of the raft is this great reinforced concrete pyramid here. You can see it's 23 feet high and the top is just there, flat top. And sitting on that flat top is a reinforced concrete cylinder that goes all the way to the top of the tower. So the entire tower is resting on this pyramid on that raft, floating on the clay. Wonderful. I'm now on my way up to the 34th floor. This is one of the fastest lifts in Europe. It does an extraordinary 25 feet a second, and it should take us only about 20 seconds to get up to the top. There we are, 34. Very impressive. Oh, wow. It would take so long to get people down from here, they decided to evacuate, if they needed to, by lift. In fact, it's the only building in the country which is allowed to be evacuated by lift. It needed special parliamentary legislation. When it opened in 1966, the BT Tower, at an enormous 620 feet high, easily took the mantle of tallest building in London. That's as high as 25 double-decker buses stacked end to end. Amazingly, until quite recently, this tower didn't exist. You wouldn't find it on any map, and it was classed as an official secret. So if you talked about it or took a photograph, you were technically breaking the Official Secrets Act. And then, in 1993, MP Kate Huey 
took parliamentary privilege and admitted its existence in the House of Commons, and she said it was at 60 Cleveland Street, so now it's officially here. And the view from up here is truly amazing. Just look, the whole of London spread out. It actually had to be very high because they wanted to beam signals right over the Chiltern Hills there on the northern rim of the London Basin. There's some really powerful aerials up there, and I'm told if I stand in exactly the right place, I may block out EastEnders and everyone will have to switch to ITV. An intriguing thing about tall buildings is the effect a bit of wind has on them. They actually start to wobble about. I went to meet Professor Chris Wise to find out how engineers deal with this problem. Now, Chris, they tell me that the BT Tower sways 20 centimetres in the wind. How does that happen? Well, you'd expect it to move a bit. It's a bit like a gigantic tree. And you see when the wind blows on a tree, it, it sways around. Everything has a sort of natural uh, oscillation. So if I push sideways as if I'm the wind, I can just push it over. Right. And the more whippy this thing is, the further it goes and the more uncomfortable you feel when you're at the top. <laughs> so what we, what we tend to do is um, join those together. Right. So this is more conventional um, tall building structure, a bit like a ladder. And you can see if I, push, if I try and push this sideways, it still moves around, but it's much more stable. Rigid, yes. Of course, if you then start putting people in, as soon as you push it sideways when the wind blows, the weight then adds to the tendency of the building to try and fall over. Right. When you get to 50 stories and above, you have to be a bit cleverer. And so something like the gherkin, you can see it's got these diagonal lines now going through it. If I push that sideways, each of those squares is turning itself into a diamond. Yes. If I try and push triangles sideways, they stay right. as triangles, which right. is a much stronger structure. So if I push that around, you can see it's very, very rigid. Oh, yes. See that? It, it, you can see it has got a natural frequency, it's but very it's, fast. it's a very high frequency, and it isn't doesn't it? Move, when I push it, it doesn't, it doesn't move anything like as far now. No. Playing with wire is all good fun, but what about the real thing? The gherkin arrived on the London skyline in 2004. I arranged to meet Chris the following day to go and have a look. So, Chris, these great chunks here, does this correspond to that crisscross structure? Yeah, this is this in inside here. It sounds hollow, but inside there are the huge bits of um, structural steelwork. And they form a big skeleton made of these diagonals and these black horizontals. Here. Right. And the whole thing carries the weight of the building and at the same time acts as a big rigid um, frame which stops the thing blowing over when the wind blows. OK. They seem to have missed out a bit of floor here. Is that just a mistake? No, this is a really important part of the whole architectural and environmental design of the building. They act as giant ventilation shafts which, which take all the hot air that's generated in the building and all the hot air that comes from the, from the sun, yep. take it up to the top there, and at which point it's extracted away. And what that means is that um, the whole of the inside of the building stays cooler, which means you can use much less energy to cool it all down. Right. So altogether, this building operates on 60% of the energy that's needed for a tr traditional skyscraper. Really? Wow. The Gherkin is an extraordinary building, both structurally and visually. But at less than 600 feet high, it's not the tallest building in London. To see that, I need to take a trip on a boat. Of the ten highest buildings in London, no fewer than seven are on Canary Wharf, there. And the highest one of all is the one with the pyramid on top, number one Canada Square. It's not just the highest in London, it's the highest in the whole of Britain. One Canada Square stands at 800 feet and was completed in 1991. And who better to tell us about this towering structure than John Pagano, who is in charge of construction? John, why doesn't this building sink into the ground? Well, we've got very strong foundations. There are 222 1.5 meter diameter piles that are driven into the ground right. almost 18 meters below the surface of the, of the ground level. And on top of that, we installed a three meter thick concrete raft over the whole area of the building. And on that, we stand the steel structure that supports the building. I mean, we built this building in three years, which is... In three years? In three years. That lot? That lot. And literally, what ended up happening is the trades chased each other up the building. So the steel structure was racing up ahead at three floors every, every two weeks. And right behind it, the concrete contractor, the cladding, the stainless steel panels that you see were only a couple of floors behind. And they literally chased each other up the building. Fantastic. One Canada Square is crowned by a distinctive pyramid and because it's so tall, it's topped by an aircraft warning light. It flashes 40 times a minute. 
Here we are in the pyramid at the very top. Is it true that no film crew has ever been up here before? Oh, you are the first film crew to be up here. Fantastic, fantastic. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's quite noisy. What's going on? Well, we have all the cooling, heat, the cooling towers that are used to reject the heat from the building. Okay. So there's seven of them up here. And basically, we take the heat that's generated by lights, computers, and people down on the office floors, and we basically dissipate it. Dump it. Dump it. My, uh, my specs are misting up here. So th this is very damp, warm air coming up here. And it's just, just damp, isn't it? Yes. You do terrible things to your hair up here. They'll never be the same again. The view from up here is amazing. I'm told that when it's clear, you can see for 30 miles. But one of the things that really appeals to me about this place is that there are birds. Listen, listen, just under here. Come and have a look at this. These boxes here are for swifts, although there aren't real ones in here yet. They're trying to attract them in. You see there's a CD player playing swift squeakings all the time, trying to bring the swifts in, which just shows that although we've learned to build up into the sky, we know who the sky really belongs to. London's skyline has changed beyond recognition since the 50s, and it's set to go on surprising us. There's about to be another explosion of new tall buildings, like the London Bridge Tower, already nicknamed the Shard of Glass. It'll be the tallest building in Europe at a staggering 1,016 feet high. Skyscrapers are all about seeing differently, quite literally. One of the things I love about these great towers is their links with the past. Christopher Wren, when he built St Paul's, used mathematics. He designed it with mathematical principles. And today's architects and engineers use computers, computer-aided design and computer modelling. And the next big one, the shard of glass, is going to be a little bit like the spires of Wren's churches, reaching ever further for the sky. Mm -hmm.